Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could teach the gullible to never be so comfortable with eyes they eat like comfort food? To disregard the bogus claims and pseudo-scientific claims, can you imagine just how much indeed the world would change? No more political predators playing on the populace with ilkas and plots to shift and kill metropolis. No more villains with the title in the Bible holding phony temper writers like the stuff they teach is vital. Imagine it was normal to have to prove a claim you made. If folks really feel ashamed expressing content that was fake, it's not to say we never make mistakes. It's just to say we go out of our way to show the evidence it takes. Remain skeptical while you travel the world or even stay trapped. We're about to get fast. That's what it is, yo. Yeah. Keep reality intact yeah. to help the truth grow. Uh-huh. Question every claim, especially the ones you believe in. Remain skeptical while you travel the world or reason. Hi, welcome to Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century. I'm Rob Penzak. And I'm David Tamayo, president of Hispanic American Freethinkers. And today we're going to be joined in a little while by Janet Hardy, one of the um, co-authors of The Ethical Slut. We're going to talk about that book and about polyamory. Um, First, we're going to cover some news and some things from last week. We want to start off with uh, Gary, a caller from last week, asked about Memorial Day, which neither David or I knew the origins for. So we uh, looked that up. It started with the Civil War, with people decorating the grave sites uh, to remember the warriors on both sides of that war. Um, eventually, in 1971, it became a national holiday. 71. In 71. And th- this is something now that covers all the different wars for American soldiers. I guess one point that I would like to go you know, from here is that it's very easy to pay lip service and you know, be, you know, if you root for our... We love the troops. Let's, yeah. Let, right, to say you have to love our wars to support our troops. And that's a false dichotomy. It's very easy to respect the men and women that take these huge risks to defend all of us and to think that some of the wars we get into you know, on our imperialist adventures are terribly misguided. I have ser- several members of my family that are in the military. And I got to tell you, they join for a, a sense of patriotism, a sense of duty that they want to help be, you know, serve this country. And, and really, they are, they, they're bound to follow the orders of our leaders, which we hope and expect that they're, that they're doing you know, really good uh, decisions. Right. And so. If, so if you really support the troops genuinely, our leaders should be really careful about the wars they get us into. If they do go to war, they want to make sure that our troops are given the equipment that they need to defend themselves. After the war, they need to provide them health care. They need to take post-traumatic stress disorder seriously. So instead of just paying lip service to this, it's really something that if you want to support our troops, do it in those meaningful ways. And maybe get rid of some of the exemptions. Um, Mitt Romney, I remember when he was running for president, mentioned how none of his five uh, sons who were all eligible for military service decide to do co- they, they decide that they're going to do the more important thing of supporting him through his campaign. Um, I think that's a little transparent. Yeah, and yeah, and, and a lot of the senators and govern uh, part of the government that sends people to war to die, they should consider, you know, do, are my children in harm's way like somebody else's children? But really, the, the best part you can support the troops and, and, and all of that is really what we do when they come back, providing them with the mental health that they need, uh, with the uh, uh, training and, and everything else. Right, that like they reintegrate with the economy. The, um, the amount of suicide on veterans is mm-hmm. extremely high. You know, people that are suffering from PTSD, uh, and uh, a lot of times people just say, oh, uh, I support the troops, but, uh, but they, when it comes to to supporting them where it counts, then they're, they, they're br- brilliant for their absence. Right, and one other thing is important, not to conflate religion you know, with military service. There's that whole thing about no atheists in the foxhole. Jason Torpy speaks about that eloquently, um, and it simply isn't true. Um, you don't need to be as religious as our military, unfortunately, is to want to defend and serve our country. Absolutely. So, um, so, do you want to go through some announcements? Yeah, so I have a, a few uh, very fast announcements. The first one, uh, maybe we can have the graphic on that, uh, is uh, one of our uh, former guests, uh, Andy Thompson, uh, last week came out with uh, his uh, book, uh, well, right. Why We Believe in God. But this book, <laughs> this book is Por Que Creemos en Dioses. Uh, it's a book that's been out uh, in, uh, in Spanish uh, for a couple of weeks. And uh, that, this book is, is really, if you're thinking, I often get the question, how can I help the Hispanic uh, population? This book is great. It's not a book about religion. It's a book about how we think and uh, how we do uh, the processes and history of why our minds like and enjoy religion mm-hmm. in general. So that's, that's it for that. Thank you, uh, uh, for Andy, for putting that book out in Spanish. I think it's going to have a, a great uh, deal of people reading it. 
Uh, also, I want to announce that uh, Hispanic American Freethinkers has a $2,000 scholarship for uh, students uh, that are, well, the, the students that get the priority are Hispanic, uh, usually underprivileged, uh, that, uh, that are, are women, uh, female, that gets extra brownie points, and also if they're the first person to attend college, uh, also in the STEM, cert, you know, all those things are points to getting $2,000. The student, they, what they have to do is just write a three-page essay, and, uh, and that's it. The uh, what's the point of contact? Do they go to your website? or how Yeah, they, they can go to Hispanic American Freethinkers uh, website at halffree.org and apply there. There's an application there that they can apply and recommend it to friends or whatever. I mean, we always talk about how expensive college is, and this is a good way of getting $2,000 uh, free just for writing a couple of pages. Cool. Uh, the other is a, it's an update on recent rally. Uh, the recent rally, uh, uh, directors and president and, and everybody were here in town this past week trying to secure a date for next year for the recent rally. They're expecting about 100,000 people to come to that uh, rally this time around. So it's really exciting, uh, and I think soon we're going to have some news. In the meantime, they're putting together a video that I think we're going to pass as a PSA here in a, in a few weeks. Uh, also, I'd like to remind every, everyone that on August 21st through the 23rd in Puerto Rico, San Juan, Puerto Rico, there's going the American Atheist Regional Conference. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to have uh, over there Matt Dilahanti and uh, Dr. Richard Carrier, who has been a guest in our show over here. Also on September 18th, we have a Posticon in, in Dallas, Fort, Fort Worth, uh, Texas. Uh, at the airport hotel Marriott, so people don't have to travel a lot, just land and, and that's it. And they have over a dozen uh, speakers there, including Dan Barker, uh, Seth Andrews, who's been in this show also, and also uh, uh, Re uh, Reginald Finley, who is the infidel guy. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, we also I want to give a shout out to the uh, uh, Hispanic Secular Humanist of North Texas. It's a, a relatively new group that has formed there, and uh, I'm going to be meeting in person sometime in, in September. And so, hopefully, uh, just just keep up the good work and and, and work hard for uh, secularism in the U.S. That's great. Yeah, and we really want to thank all the people that come on this show. You know, some people, like Richard Dawkins, are incredibly established to start with, and they really do us a service by getting us out there. Then there's a bunch of people that really service both of us that we can get some of their material out, they can help publicize us. Um, we really want this to be a success. We want to get this in front of as many people as we can. And if you write to us and, and let us know that uh, you want your group to be highlighted in here, just do so and we'll give you a shout out over here also. Right, you know, feel free to contact us you know, from Facebook if you have comments, you have topics that you want us to explore. We really are open to working with the community. Uh, if you have questions like our viewer last week, you know, give us a call and we'll try to answer them as best we can. All right, uh, so we have personal... Other, yeah, we've got a couple other announcements. Um, one is that we are going to try to break up our content a little bit so it's not as boring as just me and David sitting here talking, although we are very engaging people. Um, so we've talked to... And humble, too. And humble, too. Uh, mm -hmm. We spoke to Tombstone to Dead Man, um, a.k.a. Landon, well, I guess Landon Taylor, a.k.a. Tombstone. And so I think we're going to get some clips from him, some music, and we're going to talk to some other artists that do kind of skeptical music, uh, where they're rapping about science, skepticism, religion. Um, I think that's going to bring like a nice element to the show. So look for that over the upcoming months. We're also going to be working with Anthony Magnabosco and Peter Bogosian and get some little uh, tidbits on street epistemology and how it works and have just a, a little breakdown where you can watch for a minute. You learn one clicks. aspect of street epistemology. Um, and so we're really looking forward to that, too, and we appreciate those guys helping us out. Oh, that's wonderful, yeah. And last announcement I want to say is that um, Sarah Hader, who's mm -hmm. one of the founders of Ex-Muslims, of North America. Who's been a guest at this show. Has also. been, it was a wonderful guest at this show. Uh, just gave a spectacular speech at American Humanist Association. She's our secular person of the week. Um, she's gotten a lot of criticism and you know, felt that it wasn't received as well as she was hoped by the liberal community, which was really her target audience. Um, oddly like, enough. So, oddly <laughs> enough. I mean, it's really unfortunate. She, she gave a speech at the American Humanist uh, Convention recently. Right. And uh, the, uh, Sam Harris tweeted about it. Right, he did. He said that she's my new hero. So he was she was talking about the importance of a liberal critique for Islam. I think Islam. The, the name of the talk was Islam and the Necessity of Liberal... Of Liberal Critique, I think. Critique. That's yeah. It. And so she sort of drives home the point that if you're a liberal and you espouse these progressive values, but you sit by doing nothing and you tolerate the worst intolerance out there, and you call people bigots when they try to address dangerous ideas. You know, like yeah. the Islam has some dangerous tenets that can lead 
what might be decent people into harming other people. In a, in a way, I think we have a problem with what we call liberalism in this country. They, th they like to, th to think that tolerance, even of the intolerant, is being liberal. Right, and there's a big difference between saying, hey, you're Hispanic, I don't hate you because you're Hispanic. That's one kind of tolerance. The other is that, well, you're Hispanic, so anything you say, I'm not Hispanic, it's so I don't understand it, so whatever you want we'll is fair game. It. Yeah, and, and it's, a, it's, it's a problem in not, not uh, questioning culture, in not questioning the things that we should question. Everything should be questionable. Right, everything is fair game. If something doesn't make sense, if something harms other people, we should be asking, is this really a good idea? And if you have a good defense for why you do something, that shouldn't be an insult to you. You should say, oh, the reason I behave this way and think it's good for humanity is this, and it hasn't been an insult. All right, so uh, as a result of that, we have a couple of pieces of news that maybe we should cover right away quickly. Yeah, let's, uh, you want to So one, one is uh, that, sort of related to, uh, to her, is that the Saudi court uh, upheld uh, Raif Badawi's sentence of 1,000 lashes. Now, he was given 50 lashes and was hospitalized. I mean, so this is, this is not symbolic. This is really harsh. And uh, he's, he's sentenced to 10 years in jail. And then on top of that, he has to pay two, the equivalent of $266,000 as a fine for insulting Islam in the internet. Right, and so this is a long, slow, tortured death sentence for speaking. <laughs> Uh, for, speaking against, for, for speaking against, for questioning Islam. Right. And so what, what uh, Sarah is saying in, in, this, uh, in her speech is goes to, this is exactly the issue that she's talking right. about. Right, we need to defend people's rights to criticize things like Islam. Um, there is a little hope, that an article you pointed me to, where there's a resolution um, calling for the global repeal of blasphemy laws being put forth by a Democrat and a Republican House, of, Rep House of Representatives, right. just to be clear, where, where the resolution is coming. Right. So. You know, it would be nice if we can get this, uh, you know, who knows if it will pass. It would be nice if some people in American politics think about this more seriously. Um, and this, you know, right now we're talking about Islam, but this really applies to any religion and any ideology when you're absolutely certain that you have it right and you don't need to listen to anybody else and you start to run rampant over other people's rights. Yeah. We have 44 countries, 44 countries that, are, that have blasphemy laws, some in Europe. Mm -hmm. So we need to be really uh, up to that. Okay, we're running out of time. Okay. Uh, how about if, if I give you a joke just to comply with the rules here? Let's hear it. Let's All right, so here's the joke of the week. I'm going to read it so I don't screw it up. Okay, so an atheist commits suicide and is surprised to find himself in heaven. Wow, he says to God, you know, I didn't expect to be here. I am an atheist, and on top of that, I killed myself. So I wasn't, you know, I didn't think I was going to be here. So, uh, no, it's okay, says God. I've thought about suicide myself. He says, really? Ask, you know, why? And God answers, well, what if this is all there is? Yeah, so heaven yeah. might not be all it's cracked up to be. Now, I'm not as funny as David. My kids remind me on a constant basis. So my joke of the week wasn't particularly funny. It was more a joke of the week was Mike Huckabee, who d demonstrated his, his a-holiness. Um, in his Christian approach to transgender issues where he was quipping how he sure wishes back in his day he could pretend to be interested in going to the girls' bathroom so he could go in there. He, he feels that transgender people are pretending. Right, they're, they're faking it because it obviously serves so well um, and opens so many possibilities in life to be transgender and rise to the top of our political well, the, the sad part is that transgender people have the highest incidence of suicide. Right, it's like 41% of transgender people attempt suicide. Probably a good part of that because of the warm reception they get from evangelicals like, like Mike Huckabee. Yeah. So not so funny there. Um, and with that, I think we're ready to go to a break, have a few public and service And then we'll have our guest. Right, and we'll be back with Janet Hardy to talk about the ethical slut. One of the goals of an atheist community is to provide support for those who find themselves without faith in light of mounting evidence against unfounded beliefs. Organizations with this goal range from skeptic groups to humanist service meetups to support groups for those who may have lost a community through their deconversion. In response to this, Recovering from Religion, an organization that seeks to support those who have left their faith, has recently launched the Hotline Project. This is not a deconversion hotline. The motive behind the project is to support a growing population of people who have left their faith and need to construct their identities around a new, beautiful reality. 
If you want more information, you can visit the Recovering from Religion website at recoveringfromreligion.org. In order to block a proposed sex club in Nashville, Tennessee, lawmakers led by Councilwoman Karen Bennett invented a law that prohibited such clubs within a thousand feet of a school, church, daycare, or park. They also implemented a rule making it illegal to open a club in any building designated for office space. This effectively stymied the plans for what was to be called the Social Club. So the owners changed the name of their proposed members-only establishment to the United Fellowship Center, relabeled the rooms on their extant floor plan from such designations as the dungeon room to choir and dressing room to sacristy, and they have promised that there won't be any sexual activity on the premises. Effectively, they are now calling themselves a church, and they are expecting all the privileges and protections the law affords to religious organizations. The new plans have been approved, but City Fathers promise to keep a close eye on the goings-on to assure that they are in compliance with the restrictions on church governance, which most other churches regularly ignore. All right, we are back. Uh, we'd like this to extend This is Richard our... Dawkins. Doing commercials is unfamiliar. We are back with Richard Dawkins and also with Janet yeah. Hardy, uh, author of The Ethical Sled. Janet, how are you doing today? Well, I might be putting her on. Well, let me introduce her a little bit. Ja so okay. Janet, uh, um, and I, don't, I wanted her to ask her more directly, but she uh, is the author of The Ethical Slot, which is a uh, book that I have to admit, the first time that I saw it, I was a little bit uh, taken aback by the title because you often hear the slut shaming and uh, how women are treated as sluts and have uh, this word has been used to denigrate women fairly often. So when I first saw the, the title of the book, that uh, it made me a little bit hesitant to read it because I thought, well, obviously this, you know, don't but judge, you know where it's coming don't from judge the book by its cover. Right. Well, I had read that it was a good book, but just start, you know, it gave me a bad feeling just starting. But then as I got into the book, I realized the whole purpose of it, mm -hmm. and uh, and from what I understand, uh, so her she had a co so it's uh, Janet Hardy uh, as the uh, with a co-author Dossie Easton, mm -hmm. uh, and so we were able to. Um, uh, uh, I read the book and thought, oh, we have to have this person, uh, one or both, as a guest. Uh, uh, Dossie uh, couldn't make it, uh, but. Uh, uh, Janet was kind enough to uh, to be here uh, today. We think. Janet, are you with us yet? I'm here. Oh, great. Well, thank Excellent. you very much for joining us. Okay, there you are. So, uh, here I am. we have lots and lots and lots of questions, and I'm sure you have lots and lots of great answers. Because I don't think we're going to be able to ask anything that you haven't heard uh, before. So, maybe before we get started, why don't we get from the horse's mouth, as the saying goes, uh, what is polyamory? Uh, that kind of depends on what community you hang out with and what part of the country you're in and some issues like that. Uh, some people define polyamory as multiple long-term committed loving relationships. Other people uh, define it as uh, any alternative to monogamy. Okay. And, uh, and sensual and, and, and honest alternative to monogamy. I'm getting some echo on my voice here. Is there a way to solve that? Yeah, they're, they're going to work on that here. We're getting a little bit too. Um, okay. And is this just a tiny segment of the population, or how many people out there are involved in you know, polyamory? Nobody really knows, and part of that is the problem with definition. I mean, you know, if, if you're counting three people who have been living and loving together for 20 years in the same headcount as a long-term couple who has an occasional lover whom they share, it's going to be very difficult to, to get a nose count on how many people are consensually non-monogamous. Okay. Yeah, I saw, um, I saw four to five percent floated, but they didn't give any definition of terms, so I really didn't know exactly. who was included. And yeah, uh, you know, in, in order to define it, you would have to define words like love and sex, which gets really tricky. I'm here to tell you. Mm -hmm. um, so it's now how it's long? Not how long have you been? How long have you been polyamorous? 
Uh, since the end of my first marriage, which was in, in the um, late 80s. Okay, and, and, this, and this is a conscious decision you took uh, because you realize uh, monogamy had not worked out or, I mean, some people yeah. see it as, oh, you know, people that can't get their, in their, uh, their marriage to work figured, okay, let me just try something else and see if that works. You see a lot of that? Uh, um, it, in some cases, that is the fact. You know, people, they make a promise of monogamy without really having thought about the fact that there are other options. That's less of a problem now than it was, you know, back in 1988 or whatever, now that there's more um, understanding of polyamory as an option. But for me, you know, I, I had been a happy little slut in college, the way most of us are in college. And then I met this guy and we got married and we just sort of defaulted to monogamy, um, which is not necessarily a great way to go. Uh, but there we were and we had two kids together. And, you know, fast forward 13 years and all of a sudden I was going, wait, this is not what I wanted. This is not um, the way I see myself living the rest of my life. And so we parted as friends. Uh, he wanted a monogamous relationship. I did not. Uh, but we remained friends. Um, and from then on, I just made kind of a promise to myself that that wasn't um, a commitment I was going to make again. Okay, can you talk about the ethics of that? So if you're in the midst of a relationship and you have that large a change of heart, what's the ethical way out? What aren't the ethical ways out that, you know, that some people resort to? Talking and talking and talking and talking and crying some and talking some more and talking. Um, there's a real way, sometimes I, I sort of look at the fact that my part of the ethical slut was written in a way to help people who were in the situation that I was in my first marriage. I think if we had had a book like The Ethical Slut, we might still be together. Um, as it is, we were trying to find our way into an open relationship with no guidance, with no mentoring, with no sense that it was possible. Um, so it's, it's different now than it was then, and, and that's great. The more different I can make it, the happier I'll be. So you, you probably heard me mention the title of the book uh, when we were getting started. How did that title come yes. about? And uh, ex explain a little bit uh, if you've seen that term, because I, I mean, in, in recent years, I guess, uh, maybe within the past year, I've seen what is, what is commonly referred to as slut shaming. Uh, yeah. and, and it's a mistreatment of women, and the word is considered to be a, a, derogat a very derogatory term for women. Uh, and I know that, that you try to, to get back that term and sort of own it again. Uh, could you talk a little bit about yeah. that? Sure, absolutely. Um, we wrote the first edition of The Ethical Slut back in the mid-90s that was published in 1997. Um, and at that time, Dossie said something about, let's write a book about being ethical sluts, and we went, ha, ha, ha. Um, and we called it that as a joke between ourselves while we were working on it all the time, going, uh, you know, when we finish this book, we're going to have to come up with a real title for it. And then we finished the book, and we couldn't. And we everybody we told about it said, no, you have to call it that. So, you know, we just stuck with it, and we were very nervous about it. Uh, but it's paid off better than we ever imagined. I mean, the book... Um, we had no idea it was going to become as popular as it did. And I think the title is part of that. If you run a, a Google alert on ethical slut, it, it comes up almost every day, often in personal ads, someone saying, I'm an, I'm an ethical slut. Sometimes in personal ads say, no ethical sluts. Um, but it's, it's all over now. And I think, I think the um, awareness of our book is part of the reason that people have felt comfortable participating in something called a slut walk, for example. Um, um, in terms of slut in, in terms of slut shaming, which is a real thing, um, I I don't like to question the, the idea of slut shaming. I like to question the idea that people think there's something wrong with women who have a lot of sex. That yeah. calling a woman a slut is an insult. Yeah. Dude, has, has this, that's, uh, that's not an insult. Has this book helped change anything? You obviously get the Rush Limbaugh's that when they slut shame, they're trying to shame you know in that uh, derogatory way that. David's talking about. Sure. Has this helped move things where in the secular community or more progressive community there's an openness to hearing about this and seeing this as a legitimate other way of love? 
Absolutely. Um, it's not coincidence that both Dossie and I came of age among gay men, because among gay men, slut has always been a, a loving term. Yeah, you big slut. Um, and that's the way we want to use it as a compliment, saying you're sexual, you're free thinking, you're making yourself happy with your sex life, you're making other people happy with your sex life. That's the way we want the term to be understood by people of all genders. Mm -hmm. And it's happened. Uh, it really has. Uh, you know, I'm sure you folks are aware that in many cities uh, there have been events called slut walks that are specifically about walking back the whole idea of slut shaming. Uh, having it understood that a woman who dresses so that she shows a lot of skin or who has sex with a lot of people is not lessening her value in any way by doing that. So, um, uh, Janet, we, we're having a little bit of a problem with the communication. Um, I'm going to put you on hold for a second and uh, maybe uh, the uh, it may be that we may have to switch to a uh, phone line to get better quality of the sound. It looks like there's a bit of a lag. Okay, so uh, we'll give we'll give the the folks in the back uh, uh, our technical department uh, uh, a minute to figure out if we should continue this way or go to a phone line, and uh, and we'll be back in a minute uh, okay. with you. And then so, so meanwhile, you know, one of the things that I did want to talk to Jan about, but we can talk about it for a minute, is she talks about jealousy in the book and getting people to really own their, their emotions. So you can acknowledge if somebody's not pleased with the course of action you're going to take. Uh -huh. So if you're in this relationship with multiple people and somebody's going to go off to a conference to meet somebody and you guys have agreed upon this, you might still feel, well, why don't you spend the time with me? Yes. And so instead limited, of... The person is a limited resource. Right, right they are limited. So. But I mean, one of the main focuses is that it's okay to acknowledge, I understand why you're going to feel lonely um, in this, but just this concept of owning, yes, I'll feel lonely, understanding that emotion. And I was wondering how much this would translate out of the polyamorous community into just everyday life of how people have relationships with it. Why are you reading my mind without my permission? Very uh, <laughs> easy little slate. <laughs> no. you're, you're giving away the secrets now, you know? Next, we're gonna t we're, you're going to let people know that we don't wear any pants under here. But, well, I got pants. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, he's speaking for himself. <laughs> anyway. So, uh, the, uh, no, uh, you're right. It applies to not just the, the polyamory community. I mean, as I was reading the book, it's like, this applies to anybody in a relationship. Right, there's a real honesty openness and honesty. And right, you, it's, a, it's just a much better communication that can avoid all sorts of heartaches and misunderstandings if we all learn just to talk, to say what's on our mind, not take offense at it so much and be you know, open. I think fairly often people are... Uh, don't want to acknowledge what they feel. So even when they feel jealous, they don't want to a acknowledge that, you know, I'm feeling jealous or I'm feeling this way. But uh, it seems that, yeah, saying it, expressing it, communicating it, mm -hmm. and, and bringing it out, I'm sure that helps whether you're polyamorous or, or monogamist. Right. So, yeah. Janet, is Janet back with us where we can uh, go? Do, do you have any feelings on that? How much were you writing to just, you know, the entire population as opposed to the polyamory community? We the basic thought we had was that if you go to the bookstore and you want a book about how to be better at being monogamous, there's a whole freaking shelf of the things there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, lots and lots and lots of books about how to be monogamous. At the time that we wrote the first edition of The Ethical Slut, there was one book out about how to be polyamorous, mm -hmm. and it was about a very specific kind of polyamory, not the more general kind that we discussed in our book. So yes, one of the comments we get most often is that our book is applicable to relationships of all kinds but we specifically wanted to speak to polyamorous people because we were poly ourselves and we thought that that was where we were most needed one of the big accusations that uh, are leveled against polyamorous is that they're immoral they have uh, no shame they have uh, you know they we shouldn't have children's in those environments what are your thoughts about that and how do you respond to those accusations the no shame one is the one that really interests me because I've found through the years of being a very out, out as polyamorous, out as bisexual, out as kinky, and you know, you don't get much more out than I do. Um, that what really upsets people is not that I do all these dreadful things, but that I refuse to be ashamed of them. Um, the fact that I talk freely about my life and my sexuality is what really upsets people. It's fine if you do those things as long as you keep them quiet. And so the, the shamelessness, you know, I'm, I'm a shameless slut, and that really upsets people. Can you talk about... Um, 
So can you talk about how religion plays into that? Because one of the things I think of with most patriarchal religions is that shame factor if you violate any of their tenets. Um, do you get, do you have different reactions from you know, secular community and the religious community in your shameless approach to you know, enjoying sexuality? Um, certainly some of the established mainstream religions are not sex positive. Others are. So Oh, it's, it's just very difficult to generalize on that one. Um, for example, uh, the Unitarians have been very supportive, by and large, of open relationships and polyamory. Um, we whereas some of the fundamentalist, fundamentalist Protestant religions, not so much. Um, but if you read the Bible, you know, multiple relationships were fairly commonplace in biblical times. So I, I find it pretty difficult to, to make a religious argument against loving more than one person. I, I guess in my I'm sorry if I can follow up. I guess in my mind I'm thinking, and you know, I'm glad you pointed out because there are different religions; they have completely different approaches. I was thinking of the Christian right, which has so much political power over what different communities are allowed to do, and the response that you get from them, and how you cope with that. I'm going to make the distinction that I uh, I've heard made before. I'm going to call those Christianists rather than Christians because I don't think what they espouse has very much to do with Christ, who you know told us to love lots of people. That's what Christ says. Um, so, no, they, as, as a general rule, the religious right is anti-woman, it's anti-sex, it's anti a lot of things that I am pro. And so, no, they're not big into polyamory over there, at least not the um, negotiated kind. We all know uh, the, the most interviews I've ever done in a week was after the news hit the fan about Newt Gingrich and his wife. Um, you know, we were on in the New York Times behind that, and it was Newt Gingrich. And yeah. <laughs> how odd is that? So, you know, there, there is a certain amount of non-consensual polyamory, shall we say, going on among the religious right, but the kind that we espouse in our book, which is open, honest, shameless, etc., not so much. And, and, and so maybe this is a good time to define, uh, you know, there's polyamory, there's polygamy, and there's polyandry. How do, you define yes. those, how do you define those three terms for our audience? Polygamy means having multiple spouses. Um, it can be any gender of multiple spouses. Gammy is the, is the root for, for, for spouse, right? Uh, polyandry would be having multiple male spouses or multiple male lovers. Polygyny, G-Y-N-Y, -Y, would be having multiple female. Uh, and uh, polyamory can be any mix. So, the, so what, uh, um, when, when we hear about Mormon polygamy, it's actually, or, or Muslim polygamy, it's actually polygony, polygony. Okay, and it's very different because you have, you have the, uh, uh, in, in, when a religion is telling someone that they have to do this without any choices, then it's very different than polyamory, where it's really informed consent, is, is really having everyone in agreement and informed. Uh, which to me that makes a, I mean that's the whole difference between you know source, forced polygamy, uh, I mean forced polyamory and polyamory as we Absolutely. see it. Um, there's nothing inherent in the idea of Mormon polygamy or polygyny um, that is wrong. I mean the, the basic concept can be fine. It is often enacted in some really disturbing ways with uh, very young women, women who have not been given much choice about coming into the family and so on. Um, but if, if it works best for you to have one husband, multiple wives, with the wives all um, co collaborating in maintaining the household and raising the children, that's a perfectly valid lifestyle as long as everybody has really agreed to be there. Okay, can you talk about in the polyamory community, practically speaking, does it work out to be gender equal and equal rights, or how, how does it actually play out? Um, I'm not going to imply that polyamory is necessarily um, egalitarian. Sometimes it's not. Uh, we see um, people in the BDSM community doing polyamory with multiple female submissives, for example, or multiple male submissives, uh, um, in which case there is a negotiated power imbalance. But let's put an emphasis on that word negotiated. If it works for you to be the less power, powerful person in a relationship, then you go out and find someone who wants to be the more powerful person hook it up and go on that way. And anyone is um, free to walk away. And anyone is free to walk away. That's critical. Absolutely. Uh, when your needs are not being met or when something seems like too much for you, you, you negotiate something better or you walk away. 
that's very different than the sort of enforced relationships we see in some religious traditions. Um, that said, I personally don't do relationships that are not egalitarian. They don't work for me. Um, and I like the push and pull of trying to make sure that everybody's needs and wants are getting met as well as possible. And yes, it can work. You know, there are poly groupings that have been together for two digit numbers of years and not small two digits, large two digit numbers of years. Is there a. I just saw the death of the. The, the, the uh, woman who coined the word polyamory morning court, Glory Zell, who just lost to cancer a few months ago, but uh, she w was in a multi partner relationship that had been going on for 40 years, I think, a long time. Is there an optimal number uh, in, in a polyamory relationship? Uh, five, 10, 20, 100? Or, I mean, no, what, is, what is sort of the norm or, or what tends to gravitate? Um, the optimal number in a poly relationship is one. Um, if, if everybody is not functioning as individuals, is not, uh, not integral, integrated uh, as an individual, poly is not going to work because you start trying to get yourself fulfilled by other people. You start pulling on them too hard and then you start, the, the jealousy becomes intolerable and things kind of tend to fall apart. So the, the, the first um, qualification to be poly is, in my opinion, to understand deep in your bones that you're capable of functioning on your own. Um, once that happens, then be with one person, be with three people, be with 18 people, um, and it might work for you. The, yeah. More typically, we see threes and fours. I think it's a great point, and it really came across in your book, the importance of being an individual who's okay with themselves as the starting point. And again, I think that's a valuable lesson for every community, for all of us to learn to be comfortable in our own skins and you know comfortable with ourselves. Is there anything in place, you know, there's some communities where you could easily prey upon people. Is there anything in the polyamory community to try to help people get to that level where they're secure with themselves before launching into polyamory? Or is this just, it really just depends on the relationships you fall into? Um, I, I would strongly recommend that anybody who is thinking of um, moving toward polyamory, find some local support groups, some munches. Um, almost every city in the U.S. has at least one, often many, uh, groups where poly people gather where you can talk to other people who have done it, found out, find out what some of the difficult things might be, what some of the solutions might be. Um, this is one of the huge differences between now and when I first uh, came out as poly, is just this tremendous amount of support and the books. Last I heard there are 37 books out now, rather than the two that were out when we first published the ethical blah, blah, blah. But you know, anyone in the, in, in the, I've attended a few meetups on uh, polyamory here locally in the Washington DC area, and everyone that I've mentioned your name and I've mentioned your book, every person knows it. So it's definitely a classic. It's certainly a book that, uh, that everyone knows, and I guess, uh, uh, you know, still popular, uh, as you mentioned. So I had some uh, viewers uh, submit some questions before the show, and I have, one, I have one that I wanted to read, and maybe you can respond to. Uh, and she says, uh, recently I attended a polyamory meetup, but I was turned off by its leader because she said that her, ki her kids felt sorry for the children of monogamous, uh, of monogamous families because they didn't have as many adults involved in their lives as the poly kids. Is this a normal view uh, for poly folks uh, to feel sorry for monogamous uh, people? Um. In general, we don't much like to hear it put that way. Uh, you know, we chose poly because we want poly. Um, so obviously, when we look at monogamous lives, that's not what we want. But I don't think very many of us consider monogamy to be in any way inferior. Um, I do want to mention that some of my first urges toward polyamory took place during my first marriage, which was in a large extended, classically extended family with grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins all living within a 20 mile radius. And I would get together with my big family and my children who were at the time fairly young um, were just so much easier uh, when there was this large group of adults. We used to vacation together at a beach house and there would usually be like 17 people uh, along four generations staying in this beach house and my kids were happier with that many grown-ups around. 
because if you needed your shoe tied or you wanted a game played with you or you wanted someone to make you a sandwich, you didn't have to go pull your mom or your dad. You could go ask your aunt or your cousin or your great grandma to do that for you. Now, and I, I kind of think that, you know, if you look at pre-industrial cultures, that's how humans kind of came together is in small tribes. So I think there's a reason why our kids like to live like that. Um, yeah, I think we can all agree on the importance of the extended family like that. Um, some people make a slippery slope argument that if you allow gay marriage, if you allow transgender people to feel like human beings, um, if you accept polyamory, that you're heading down to all sorts of terrible things. Can you distinguish, um, talk about incest versus polyamory. You're talking about kind of this mutual consent area. Obviously, if there were kids involved, it would be completely different. So can you address that and also talk about the slippery slope? Is there a problem or risk in just extending you know, friendship to other human beings? Um, I think that incest, of course, is problematic because it's so strongly prescribed in pretty much all human cultures, well, not all, but most, uh, cross-culturally, cross-historically. And yet, um, I fail to see a problem with, for example, gay incest. And any time that children are not an option so that you lose the reason that it's so strongly prescribed, which is to um, eliminate inbreeding. Um, I'm personally not seeing the problem. Well, I have no let, let me, intention of sleeping with my sister. But. Uh, let, me, let me jump in there. You know, with incest on, on brothers and sisters, I guess, or you know, if, if um, having babies isn't an issue is one thing. With parents and children, that level of incest brings in a completely different dynamic that for non-religious <laughs> reasons, I would, say, I'm sorry? Yeah, in much in ways that student teacher sex or you know, coach athlete sex, when there's a power differential, yes, it's problematic. Um, that's irrelevant to whether the people share DNA or not. If one person has power over another real world power, which is almost always the case when one person is underage, um, then yeah, there's a problem. It's very difficult to distinguish between honest sexual desire and, and the normal human desire to please someone who has power over you. Right, and so, is so, that, so, so is that would be something strictly outside bounds. If you do have multiple adults in a setting with multiple kids from different partners, every adult has to respect the bounds of every child. Is that fair to say? I would certainly think so, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that that would be very important. So sort of related to this in the sense of uh, the, a lot of these issues have come up during uh, debates for same-sex marriage and, and a lot of people say, oh, but if you have that, then what's next? Polyamory, you know? And I'm thinking, so in, in your world, in a perfect world, 100 years from now, 500 years from now, would you advocate or would you like to see uh, leg le the legalities and the benefits that a uh, monogamous couple have when they get married, would you like to see those extended to a polygamy setting? Uh, when I run the world, what will happen is that government will be out of the marriage business altogether. I don't understand why government is in the marriage business, why uh, we privilege some relationships over others uh, in our tax structure, in our legal structure. Um, what I would like to see is domestic partnership available to any number of partners who want to enter into that to together as a legally recognized relationship where you sign papers together and like a business partnership, a subtype of business partnership. Then if you want uh, marriage from a religious viewpoint, right, go find yourself a church that marries people like you and get that. Um, but uh, the, you know, I'm, I'm sure I, I'm preaching to the choir, so to speak, mm -hmm. here on your show, but that, that's the way I see this. Well, there's also, I mean, marriage uh, also has inheritance and uh, it has uh, you know, benefits for health care and, and uh, visitations rights and, and certain things, you know, a lot of things that, that go with, with uh, that are rights, especially for children uh, being able to educate or who, how they're raised, that kind of stuff. Uh, it becomes far more complicated in a, in a polyamorous relationship. Uh, so are you suggesting that all of those things should be put in writing so everyone can know what the Absolutely. rules are? Absolutely. Just as if uh, the two of you were to start a business together, you would have to make some decisions about, you know, if you own copyrights together on your programs, who would own those if one of you died, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of that would have to be encoded in writing. And it would not be an easy process, and it shouldn't be. 
you would you would need to either get some really good legal forms from like Nolo Press, or more preferably, you would hire a lawyer um, who would help you draw something up that meet, met your needs. Um, well, I'll continue on comparing polyamory versus marriage in, a, in just a regular conventional two-person marriage. One of the sort of things that you get in the bargain is that you hopefully love each other, take care of each other in sickness and health. When thing go, things go wrong, everybody stays put and tries to work through that, even though that obviously is not the case quite often. How does that work in the polyamory community? Is that something that you negotiate at the beginning? That it just depends if it's a, a mostly sex relationship or mostly emotional relationship? And how does it usually play out? How many long-term relationships are there? What usually happens when somebody gets older and has health problems? Well, I can speak to this very directly. The reason my co-author Dossi is not on the air with us is she had major spinal surgery back in January and was off her feet for several months. Um, and pretty much every minute of every day she was being watched over by her lovers or her lovers' lovers who were there taking care of her and making sure she was okay. That's the one of the, the best things about poly in my experience is you get these kind of extended kinship networks that function like the old fashioned extended families did, where when someone is sick, when someone is sad, when someone is in trouble, there's people around who can help with that. So one of the number one reasons that, you know, uh, heterosexual straight two party couples fight, my wife and I, uh, uh, is finances. It would seem to me yes. that, that this becomes sort of exponentially more of, a, of an issue, of a problem uh, once, you know, somebody drank all the milk and didn't replace it and, and now you, a lot of people can go like this. And or say, if, you're, if you're funding a lover's trip to a conference to hook up with somebody else. Exactly. You know, how, how, how does that typically handle or how is that minimized in order to make it work? Polyamorous people tend to be very, very good communicators because otherwise, yeah, things are going to blow up pretty quickly. So the, the general attempt is to not let things like that um, steam. You know, you, you try to address them soon and directly and make agreements. We don't talk so much about rules in polyamory. We like to talk about agreements because agreements are flexible. You know, if one week, you know, someone drank all the milk and so person A says, okay, I'm going to be responsible for keeping the fridge full of milk. And after a couple of weeks of that, they go, you know, I thought this was going to be easier than it is, but it's not fitting in my life. Let's talk about it again. And then they talk about it and say, okay, I will do it in odd number of weeks and you do it in even number of weeks or whatever. Um, you just go on working on it. Don't do a lot of blaming. We're not big on blaming. Um, and get it straightened out. If you're talking a lot about what happened in the past instead of how you're going to fix it in the future, you've got a problem. Um, <clears throat> um, in my kind of anti-theistic view, I usually see religion, especially religious politicians, as talking about ethics but being very unconcerned about the actual ethics. Um, I want to get your take on sex education, safe sex practices. You know, you have religious leaders like George Bush who cut off um, all funding unless somebody goes with abstinence only. What's yeah. the polyamory's approach to educating their kids and to actual safe sex practices within the community? Um, when I was working on the phone lines at San Francisco Sex Information, our rule of thumb was if someone is old enough to ask the question, they're old enough to hear the answer. And I think that's a really excellent rule of thumb. Um, I do think, uh, I, I know when I was raising my kids when they were small, I went a little overboard a time or two, um, giving them more information than they were comfortable having. I can remember a rather embarrassing conversation with one of my sons on that one. Um, but just being open, being available, answering their questions with as much honesty as possible. Um, there are good resources online um, for sex information for young people. Um, and some good books also. All of that can be done. But no, I do not in any way suggest withholding sex information from, from children who want it. Abstinence, you know, you can track the states that have abstinence education to the highest pregnancy rates and STD rates in the country. You know, we have evidence that it does not work. Um, so, you know, I don't understand why we're still messing around with that. Mm -hmm. Uh, so when it comes to uh, sex in a poly relationship, are there any some do's and don'ts that you recommend? 
Um, yeah, I think you, you were leading me to talk about uh, safer sex in poly relationships, which is, which is obviously essential. Uh, if you're, well, it's essential in all relationships, but if you're being explicit about having whatever is sex for you with more than one person, you have to decide how to keep yourself and your lovers safe from all the various nasties that are out there. Uh, what a lot of poly people do is what's called fluid bonding, where you are in a primary relationship with one or maybe two people, and or maybe three, I don't know. Mm -hmm. More than that, and it wouldn't work. And you just make an agreement that um, with each other, you will get tested together and then be able to not use barriers. But if you have sex with someone outside that relationship, you must use barriers. And if the barriers fail, then you have to start over again with getting tested. Um, that's the commonest pattern. Uh, my own pattern is that I don't have a high or medium risk sex outside my primary relationship. I don't like it well enough for it to be worth the risk. Um, and so I just do other things. There are ever so many wonderful sexual things one can do without um, passing disease. And I just do those instead. And, and I forgot if I read this in your book or just in some polyamory articles, um, but I think it was you talking about how it changes the psychology. If you have somebody that's just planning to cheat on their partner, they might not want to admit it so directly. If they go and purchase condoms a week ahead of time to plan their little rendezvous, they are now, it's a premeditated betrayal of their partner, whereas if it just happens, and so they don't have a con, but it just happened, they feel psychologically different. Whereas in the polyamory community, you don't have to go through all that psychological shenanigans and play, you just are safe and protect your partner. So I think it really does lead, you know, as long as all that consent is there ahead of time, at least in that aspect, is a much more ethical way of treating your partners. Um, yeah, that, that makes, I don't think that would from our book, if I'm remembering correctly, but yes, it makes total sense. If you're owning your own sexuality and not trying to pretend that, you know, you're, it just happens. Um, sex never just happens, come on. Uh, we, are, we, we have four brains, we know how to use them. We decide to have sex. And so in, in Polly, we own the fact that sometimes we decide to have sex and that part of the decision to have sex is to be prepared for it. So in, in, a, Scott. in one of those uh, uh, meetups that I attended, uh, one of the people in the meetup said, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in, in polyamory. Uh, my wife is not, and you know, so she's really not going to be part of it. It's just going to be me and others. Um, the thing that came to my mind immediately said, well, that's not polyamory. That's cheating. That's just cheating. So no, not, my, not as long as she knows. Not if she doesn't know? No, if she does know. You know, if oh. she knows that She's sleeping with other people and she's given her consent. Um, poly monogamous relationships where one person is poly and the other is monogamous, they're not common, but they're not rare. Yeah, no, she didn't Sometimes. know. <laughs> that was the thing. Oh, she, she didn't know? She didn't know. Poly. Yeah. Uh, it, it reminded me of when I was a little kid and, and I used to say, yeah, that, that girl over there, she's my girlfriend, but she doesn't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> so my question related to that is, what do you recommend for someone who is curious and uh, perhaps considering this lifestyle how should they approach their spouse about it? Um, it's a hard question to ask because, you know, I've got my name on the cover of a book. It's not something that comes up very often for me. Um, mm -hmm. But the people that I've talked to who have succeeded with it, they sit down, they have a conversation with the spouse saying, you know, it's occurred to me that it might be really fulfilling for us to open the relationship up a little bit. Uh, can we talk about where your comfort levels are with that, things that might work for you, things that might not work for you, and baby steps, you know, it might be a matter of sitting down together and looking at personal ads together and just saying, this person might interest me if we were to open our relationship up, this one wouldn't, and having some free conversation about it just to kind of get those uh, pathways of thinking opened a little. Um, Certainly don't run off and have sex with anybody until you feel pretty sure that's the thing to do. Um, some couples start by sharing a lover because that feels safer than having people going off where you can't see them and uh, having sex together. Uh, it's, everybody has a different comfort, comfort level with different things. Almost everybody discovers uh, that something they thought would be easy turns out to be difficult and that something they thought would be difficult turns out to be easy. So you can't know until you try. Um, now, in a, most healthier marriages, hopefully each partner is okay with their spouse having significant relationships on the outside as long as they're non-sexual. So, you know, if somebody has an old friend that they still bond with, they still talk about very important matters, that's perfectly fine within, you know, a good marriage. So how much of polyamory is really coming down more just to sex 
as opposed to being okay with support of emotional relationships? Uh, that's a question that gets argued at length in poly groups. Um, and I'm not going to touch it with a 10 foot pole. Yeah. But I will say, I don't see a hard line between the friend with whom you have sex and the friend with whom you don't have sex. If the emotional bond is there um, with the, the outside friend, I would say you are at least exerting some of the skills that poly involves, whether you call it poly or not. You're managing the needs of two people that you love. It's a, some people. Uh... Well, with your years of experience, I wonder if do you see a greater uh, expression of bisexuality and sexually uh, f as fluid people uh, in, in uh, this type of relationships than in monogamy? Um, I would say it, it's sort of a truism that there are a number of bisexuals in the poly community. Uh, um, monogamous bisexuals fight this a lot because people assume that if you're bisexual, that means you must be poly. That's not at all the case. Uh, any more than being attracted to women who aren't your wife means that you are poly. Um, but, but poly and bisexuality they do seem to fit for a number of people. Um, I was recently visiting in Melbourne, Australia, doing some speaking there, where they have a wonderful, wonderful sort of poly, bi, kinky, queer community where everybody's all together, and I love it there. Um, and it started as um, Victoria, uh, Vic Polly, Victoria Polly, and expanded outwards from there into bisexuality, from there into trans and kinky, and all the other flavors of the way people relate. And that's, I don't know too many communities that are fortunate enough to have expanded that thoroughly, but that is the way these things tend to move. Do, do you see a difference? You know, cognitive science now shows that there really are different brains um, involved in liberals and conservatives. Um, and, you know, so liberals do tend to be more open to new experience. Do you tend to see many more liberals in the poly community, or is there a political balance? Um, there are some conservative poly people, but as in all the alt-sex communities, um, we, we, we skew heavily toward liberal and sometimes radical. Um, I think it's partly, you know, some of those studies about conservative brains and liberal brains, uh, we tend toward people who like a lot of change and a lot of activity and a lot of differentness in our lives. Because if we wanted everything to be the same, we'd be monogamous because that's more stable. Uh, um, so yeah, I think we, we like the excitement of a world where things change a lot. Does that translate into more poets, more authors, more writers, more musicians? Do you see it in that way also? More art. <laughs> well, again, we're running into some of the problems we talked about in the beginning with the demographics of poly. But yes, I would mm -hmm. say more creative people in the poly community, in, in any of the alt-sex communities. So considering that there are now some TV shows uh, on polygamy and at least one on polyamory uh, that I've seen. Uh, it appears that American society is far more open about relationships than even just five years ago. In light of this, do you have any plans to uh, follow up uh, on your book or uh, maybe a TV show about polyamory? Um, I would love, but there, there is a web series called The Ethical Slut that is based on our book. Um, I'd love to see it reach an even wider audience. Um, I have not uh, All right, you know, we are wrapping up this very second. We're going to post any extra comments on our page. Thank you so much for joining us. Check us out on Facebook, like us, and we'll see you next week.